Some of you may have seen Tracy's talk yesterday. I was flying in, so I missed it. I'm so sorry. But uh, Well Played is started as a series of books in a journal where people do deep readings of video games, trying to unpack what it means to play those games, kind of like you do a close reading of a novel or of a movie. So that was the whole idea. And I actually started on stage with people talking about games and playing them live to really illustrate and highlight what they're doing. So Nick is going to play one. We thought it'd be really fun to do it for Games for Change in terms of the finalists in here. So Tracy yesterday did Gone Home, and Nick's going to do Papers, Please this afternoon. So I want to get off stage so you can do that. But before I do, one quick plug in terms of Games for Change. A group of our students uh, are making a game called Feed. They made a feed game for the festival. It's a big game that's gonna happen tomorrow morning out in Washington Square Park from nine to like 11.30. Uh, so it's addressing hunger issues, but everybody please come, bring a smartphone, you can come out there and play the game throughout. They'll be running it continuous tomorrow morning. So I'm gonna get off stage and let Nick come out here. Nick, come on out. Hi everybody. Um, so, I'm going to be talking about uh, Papers, Please. Um, please excuse me that I have my phone in my hand. This is the way I'm looking at my slides. Um, so I don't have to constantly do this to you. Um, so to, before I begin, because this came up last time, um, I am not the designer of this game. This is the designer of this game, Lucas Pope. So you know, please direct any questions to the critic of the game and not the designer of the game, unless the designer of the game is here or present. And I do encourage you to talk to Lucas, because he's very smart. and knows what he's talking about. All right, so uh, papers please, quick description of the game. Um, uh, the game takes place in a fictional universe um, that's based in the sort of 80s uh, Soviet Union and Soviet Socialist Republics. Uh, you, take, you are in a place called Arstotska, um, and you are effectively hired uh, through lottery to run a border with another nation uh, nearby uh, that has been you know, effectively kind of annexed um, and there are a number of other surrounding nations around. So basically, you live in a geopolitical landscape that is obviously very controlled and obviously um, quite uh, bureaucratic, and your role is to, to sort of participate in that structure. Um, you basically have a family, and your goal, this, by the way, all my slides are dark with light, so lights down on stage would be great. Um, uh, you run a family, and you basically have to manage your family through this process, and the family isn't all, ever very well defined. These are the terms that you get are, are things like you know, wife, son, mother-in-law, but you maintain them through the whole game, and your task is effectively to manage the border, which you do um, through a, a pretty straightforward game mechanic of, of effectively looking at the data that they give you and matching that to requirements that you're given about who should be accepted uh, and rejected from entry. So you basically take a, a, a single significant action, which is to approve or deny people into the country. Um, now, you can basically figure this out by looking for discrepancies in their data. Um, so you're given a set of documents, and you're basically asked to verify that the documents are real, and they can be false in a number of ways. Um, it could be that the person doesn't match the data. It could be that pieces of data don't match. So you may find that a passport number is inaccurate in different places or an issuing city is wrong. You may also find that documents have been actively forged because some of the stamps have been incorrect. Um, and the idea is that when you find these discrepancies, you can highlight them and interrogate the people involved by hitting this thing here. Um, and based on the answers they give you, you may also have the option to detain them or to search them. Um, of course, um, news events happen during the game. So as the game goes on, different things happen which cause policies to change. And as a result, um, the process of coming into Arstotska gets harder um, and harder. And that makes your task harder and harder. But you earn credits to take care of your family on the screen I showed you earlier based on how many people you process. So accurate processing is kind of critical. And you know, as you, you know, find some of these discrepancies, you are basically doing the job of like protecting the nation. Um, and that becomes really critical because as the game goes further, you actually are enabled in different ways to help continue to protect the border. Um, and the outcomes of you not protecting the border are, are quite harmful, right? So basically the gameplay is this sort of extended um, process of an ever complexifying border security job which a lot of it is really just kind of spot the difference mechanics and sort of quick movement on the screen to, to hunt and pack. Um, but it's all tied around this kind of bureaucratic reality 
um, of you looking for forgeries and making decisions about who gets to come and go from the country. And the narrative is effectively built around this. Um, people come into the, into the station and you talk to them um, briefly. You get insights into some of their stories. Um, and you encounter other officials who you work with who give you different conditions under which to work, threaten you, or attempt to collaborate with you in, in legal and illegal ways. Um, I'm talking about Papers, Please, because I actually think Papers, Please is, is, is the best serious game that was made last year. And in my mind, is one of the most important serious games ever made, certainly the best in the last several years. Um, and I feel this way for a number of reasons. And what I want to talk about through the bulk of this talk is why I think that's the case. And so my analysis of this game is really based on like, the fact that it is, um, uh, it is a really interesting example of what one can do with a game on a topic when one takes that approach. Now, the first reason why I think this game is very important is because it's actually generally recognized as an indie game. And if you look around the indie game community, um, it's actually a much lauded game in the indie game community. Um, and it was presented in that community first. So at the IGF, um, the Independent Games Festival, which is a part of the Game Developers Conference, um, a number of awards were, were given out to games for topics like ne ex uh, ne excellence in narrative, excellence in gameplay, um, you know, overall excellence, and Papers, Please won several awards. Um, so many that, that, that Lucas was joking on stage about how, uh, how many times he had been on stage with this game. So that this game was considered successful um, as a commercial entity, I think, is, is undeniable. Certainly, critically, it was very well received. And it was well received in part because of its topic, but it was also well received because of its play. And so I think this is a good example of a place where when we start thinking about the possibilities that serious games can have, and games for change can have, and games for impact can have, we can look at Papers, Please, and say, OK, well, this doesn't have to live in a ghetto of games that are understood to be games for impact that can't intersect the rest of the game industry. Papers, Please is a very strong example of a game that is understood by different populations to serve different purposes and can penetrate a much broader market, um, even with a, a very clear intent to ask uh, non-entertainment questions and to, to really challenge us aesthetically. So I guess the question then is, what is Papers, Please about? Because right? if we're going to say that it's a serious game, we should talk about like, what, what, it is, what is it doing that's like sort of trying to push beyond sort of simple entertainment? Well, the obvious answer would be to say that it's about border security, right? which is not an issue that Americans are unfamiliar with. Right? This is something that we deal with all the time. And it, the questions around like, the trade-offs we make for security and safety um, you know, in a world that has terrorism and potential threats and smuggling and drug abuse. Um, all of these things are things that we're, we recognize and that they're realities that we deal with. And the bureaucracy of this is something that we, we know quite well. We live in a place where there's an ever-changing set of somewhat arbitrary rules that don't seem to make any sense but simply make it very difficult for us to get through the border. And in fact, some of the imagery that Papers, Please uses is directly drawn from the imagery that we see and the way the TSA operates and some of the questions around what the TSA does. So it's, it would be easy to start by saying that, well, clearly, Papers, Please is a comment on the sort of security state in which we live and the complexities of that security state and what happens with bureaucracies and untrained agents as untrained agents intersect with a world of you know, complexity and difficulty and other bureaucracies and evil. Um, but actually, I don't think that's what's interesting about Papers, Please, although I think that's true. Um, and I think the game does a good job of exploring that. In fact, what I actually think is really interesting about Papers, Please is that it's not exactly a game asking you to explore the complexities of bureaucratic reality when you look at the gameplay. Obviously, the content is about that, as we've just shown. You know, the content is exploring all of these issues. But the act of playing the game explores something else. And this comes out of a twist in the mechanic that's really critical. When you fail to accurately judge someone as approved or denied, right? when you miss a mistake in the passport, or you miss a forgery, or you accept someone despite one of these things, you get a citation. If you get enough citations, meaning three, you become penalized monetarily. So you, don't, you start to lose money as a result of this process. So if you continue to get uh, approvals and rejections wrong, you start to lose money, which is critical. Um, 
because this is how you take care of your family. And as you can see from this screenshot, um, if you don't take care of them, they will die. Um, they actually go through a process to die. They can get cold, and they can get sick, and they can get hungry. And if they're sick and you don't get the medicine, they can get very sick. And if they get very sick, they can die. Um, the game ends when all of your relatives die. That's one of the possible endings. There's 20 endings in Papers, Please, and they go in a variety of directions. But uh, there's something telling about the fact that you have a son um, who can get sick. Um, and I feel like it's a pretty powerful motivator to look at your, you know, to look at your ability to purchase food for your son. This interface here allows you to choose whether you get food or heat because you, know, you don't necessarily make a lot of money. Um, and so you, you're choosing whether to give people medicine, you're choosing whether to give them food. But you're also choosing to approve or reject someone. And I think this is a really critical point in the game is that you are never put in a position where you have to reject anybody. You can always choose to accept anyone that you want. So the question that the game is continually asking you as you look at these people coming through your border crossing and make decisions about whether they'll be allowed to enter Arstoska or go back is whether you want to take the citation for this person. Knowing that the citation is going to affect your family. And that, ultimately, is a question of ethics. And what I think is fascinating about Papers, Please is that Papers, Please is one of the best games exploring ethics I have ever played. Now, games do explore ethics. It's not like this is unusual for games. Games like, like to explore issues of morality and explore morality and try to figure out how morality works. And so we have this very typical understanding of morality that's, I think, largely Star Wars based, right? Where basically we have like a light side and a dark side and we have a meter. And then you do things in the game. It's like, oh, there's a puppy. Do you run the puppy over with your car or do you take it and give it to a good home, right? And if you give it to a good home, you get light points. And if you give it to a, you know, if you run it over with your car, you get dark points. Right, and, and this meter sort of slides up and down. Um, and you may have played a game like this, right? I think the Star Wars games are quite good for this. And one of the things we know about Star Wars is that actually, like, your ability to be light or dark is what enables your sort of power in the Force, so that it is actually how light or dark you are that tells you what you can do as a Jedi, and you have to be really, really good at being good or bad to end up doing stuff like this. Right? And this is true in the games, right? Like, to, to be able to shoot lightning out of your hands, you have to have a lot, a lot of dark side. But that creates this kind of weird structure, right? Where, like, first of all, that instrumentalizes these ethics in a way. Because to get this power, I actually have to commit to darkness. And so I'm certainly not always thinking about the dark thing that I would do. I may just be thinking that I want to shoot lightning out of my hands. So how many puppies do I have to run over? What is that? 50, 60, okay, cool. Run, 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 run. Lightning yet? Nope, run, 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 run. Lightning yet? All right, rock. Um, but the second thing it does is it creates this sort of weird middle space that doesn't make any sense. Like, if I do a little bit of light stuff and a little bit of dark stuff, like say I'm not a perfect saint or an absolutely abhorrent devil, as unbelievable as that could be for a human existence, um, I don't get anything. I end up in this sort of muddy middle where I get no abilities whatsoever. And so to, to actually achieve in games with these kind of ethical systems, I actually have to push myself to these border cases. And so my ethical decision making in this game is kind of ridiculous. It's like I'm basically just opportunizing my ethics. And this doesn't have to be framed as good and evil. We could frame it as Paragon and Renegade, and then we could give you choices based on whether you're Paragon enough or Renegade enough that only appear in certain contexts. But it's the same basic thing. Like I instrumentalize my ethical decision making because the system is kind of rewarding me for it. And you know, I've given two examples here, but I could do a 50 slides if I wanted to of games that work this way because that's a typical way that ethics are explored. And when they're not explored that way, um, they're often tried to, to be created in ways that, that intersect the game mechanic in a natural way so that nobody is ever really punished or suffers or has to make any terribly difficult decision. Um, the classic example of this is Bioshock. So in the game Bioshock, um, you are given the opportunity through the narrative, which I won't get into a lot of detail to, to find these, these sort of possessed little girls who run around with giant monsters. And when you kill the giant monster, you get access to the little girl. And this little girl is basically a walking sack of something called Adam, 
which gives you energy. And whenever one of these little girls is alone in Bioshock and you've killed the big monster that escorts it, you can choose to harvest the little girl or rescue the little girl. If you harvest the little girl, you basically rip her open and kill her and take all the atom out of her. If you rescue her, you, you relieve her of a, her effective possession and you get some atom for that, but not as much. Right, so you can see a kind of like, again, we get the sort of force analogy, right? There's like the dark side, you know, not better, faster, easier it is, right? Um, so if I harvest, I get more atom. If I rescue, I get less atom. And that, you know, start, that starts to feel ethical, right? Like the choice to do good is somehow more difficult. But even if that were the case, you know, again, still instrumentalized, I'm still only thinking about good and evil because I get Adam from it. Um, in uh, Bioshock, if I rescue enough girls, I get a gift from the girls that gives me just about all the Adam I would have got anyway. Because the game really doesn't want to punish me for making a good choice. It doesn't want to punish me for making an ethical choice. If I choose to play ethically, it wants me to have a balanced game experience. Um, and so it just gives me the Adam I would have lost anyway. Which, when I played Bioshock, I was outraged by. Because my assumption was that by making this action, I was sacrificing. And that the game would cheaply undermine my sacrifice in the sake of a balance that I never asked for was outrageous. I knew what I was doing ethically. Right? I wanted that thing to be ethical. But all of these things point to kind of the same problem. Right? Like, like in, and you have to forgive me because I always get theoretical in these things. Um, and I, I almost never get to talk about philosophy, and I studied it, so, so get ready for heavy <laughs> philosophy. All right, so our understanding of, of this kind of ethical dilemma really comes from Immanuel Kant. Um, and, and Kant sort of tried to attempt to an analyze and you know, sort of universally categorize ethics. And that framework, while controversial even at the time he made it, um, became kind of our basic understanding of this. And one of the core points that Kant makes when he talks about ethics is this idea that he brings up in the groundwork of the metaphysics of morals, which is one of like the classic ethical texts. If you're interested in studying ethics, this is like one of the first books you should read. Kant is not easy to read, by the way. It's a kind of very complex and messy language, but, but really fascinating theories um, to, to, to argue for or against. Um, what Kant ultimately argues in this is, is one idea of what good is, is the idea of goodwill. That, like, that for something to be good, it has to be born of goodwill. And, and the, way, the quote that I like about this that describes it is, a good will is not good because of what it affects or accomplishes, because of its fitness to attain some proposed end, but only because of its own volition. That is good in itself. So one of the ways that Kant defined ethics, and it's a way we still think about ethics today, is that good action is not defined by instrumentality. I don't do good things because I get something for doing something good. Because if I do that, then it's not really good. It's not altruistic. Something is altruistic when I don't immediately benefit from it in a material way. Like I make this decision because it is like of its own volition good in and of itself. It's a good thing, ethically, independent of its effect. And one of the problems that games have in dealing with ethics is that when games quantify the ethical decision, they are violating the idea of goodwill. Like, they basically tell you that there's another reason to do something good other than the goodness of the action. So anytime I get powers based on being good, or I get experience based on being good, or I get selections based on being good, I've already kind of been undermined in terms of the goodness of what I'm doing because now suddenly there's another reason why I might do it. And in fact, as I described, I might simply do it for that reason. Um, however, Kant, Kant takes this into a place where he starts talking about basically how we can universalize ethical systems. And what he wants to really do is define an ethics that's universal so that we can always use it. And this was an extremely controversial thing to do. So um, a, a fellow philosopher in Kant's time named Benjamin Constant posed an ethical dilemma to Kant that he felt came out of the groundwork of the metaphysics of morals that is really one of the defining ethical questions of our time. And when you study ethics, you'll, like if you ever take an entry level ethics class or philosophy class, you're gonna hear this question at some point. Let's say a murderer knocked on your door looking for your friend, okay? And let's say that friend is hiding in your closet. And the murderer says, hey, where's your friend? What do you do? All right, do you lie? Because lying is wrong. No, think, think about it, think about it, right? Okay. So what Constance says, you know, which, which we kind of take for granted today, is that lying is worse, murder is worse than lying, right? So like if you, like having your friend get killed is worse than you telling a lie, so you should lie, and that would be the ethical thing to do in that situation. 
And Kant, who, you know, Kant was trying to trip Kant up, Kant's just like, he just takes the bait and says, no, if we, if we actually accept that lying is wrong, it's always wrong. The context doesn't matter, it's always wrong. So even if your friend is hiding in your closet and the murderer is at the door and the murderer says, where's your friend? You are not allowed to lie about that. You committed an unethical action. Now, this is an extreme case, but we can imagine, we can imagine out ethical cases where these kind of debates matter. Does context matter? Do, do other kinds of decisions matter? Does the threat of harm to other people matter? Like, like does the threat of how many people? If I hurt one person and not many people, if more people benefit than the person hurt? Like, do, what, where are these kind of questions, like, like how do we answer these questions? Like, what, where does this make sense? Like, what is the good action? Is it universal, or is it completely contextual? Or is it always based on the culture we come from? Or can we say universal things about ethics? That's what ethics is about. That's what ethics is, is answering those kinds of questions. Ethics is not a mathematical system of good and evil. Ethics is a question of how one chooses to value things and what that value does in a hierarchy of action when the action is difficult. Which takes us back to Papers, Please. Because again, in Papers, Please, you have a very interesting point of decision making. You get two chances to approve or reject someone incorrectly, according to the bureaucracy. At third one, you begin to get penalized. And as we mentioned, those penalties cause harm to your family. So, when do you let someone through or keep someone back? What about when the gender doesn't match? Because you're not supposed to. Invalid gender is supposed to eliminate someone. But if someone's passport says they're a man, and they promise they're a man, but they don't look like a man, is that an ethical dilemma for which you would potentially cost your family food? What if they wanted to bribe you? What if they were smuggling something in, like watches or drugs? Right? Or weapons, for that matter, because they can smuggle that too. And they offer you credits, which will feed your family. Which one of those is a decision that you would take 10 credits for? And which one of those would you feel bad about? And again, all the system cares about is how many penalties you have and how much money you make. So you can make this decision if you want to. What about if you knew someone was a criminal, like say this guy who is a pimp? And if the person who comes before this person asks you, hey, the guy after me, I think he's going to enslave me and my sister. So even though all his paperwork is good, don't let him through. And you will never see that woman again. Do you take a penalty for this guy to keep this guy out? What if a husband asks you to protect his wife? And so she's missing the permit she needs. He gets through fine. You can approve him. But do you approve her? Is she worth the penalty? What if they tell you they'll be killed? What if they couldn't get a, a, a passport, or they couldn't get a form because they're a political prisoner? What if they're a journalist looking to cover your country? What if they're actually trying to take down this horrible dictatorship that keeps you in this job that underpays you and starves your family? <laughs> and what if they want you to assassinate somebody to help them get through, or reject somebody to help them get through, to, do this, to work for this cause, these people you don't know, this masked person with the star? Is that worth it when there's zero tolerance for insolvency? Or when investigators could come looking for you? So what Papers, Please does, um, and what's interesting about Papers, Please narratively, because, you know, and there have been arguments. I've actually been talking to people at the, con at the conference today even who have been saying that, like, oh, Papers, Please as a narrative is, you know, it's not, it's not like the gameplay does anything with the narrative that strong. It's not like the narrative's that deep. And I don't think the narrative in Papers, Please is actually that deep. I think if you look at other indie games that have explored narrative, like Cart Life, which I spoke about about a year ago, I think Cart Life has a much, much deeper and more, um, a more literary narrative than Papers, Please. But what Papers, Please asks us is over and over again to make these kind of ethical decisions. And by doing so, it challenges us about what we actually consider ethically important faced with threats to our family. And it does it not by evaluating 
the ethics of our choice. Because if it did that, then the system would be telling us, right, through its instrumentality, this was the right thing to do, this was the wrong thing to do. You got more power, you got more prestige, you got more options, right? That was obviously right. It does it by simply giving us the choice with enough freedom to make the choice, but enough consequence that the choice is meaningful, and it asks us to make decisions. And if you talk to people who pay papers please, you will find people make completely different decisions about who they let through. Is, is gender the issue that you care about? Is family the issue that you care about? Is freedom the issue that you care about? Is just feeding your son and your wife the issue you care about? And Papers, Please is not going to tell you which the right answer is. It's just going to give you a single choice every time. Thank you. So I have four minutes and six seconds. If anybody wants to comment or uh, poke. Yes. Um, what about Tokyo and the movie The Walking Dead, where they, they have like a um, uh, thing where they don't explicitly give the reason the second story is different is because it doesn't, the question doesn't matter what the story is about, but it's because they don't die in the first place to, um, uh, to get sick. If the first story was different, they die and that's what makes it clear that it's two folks. And um, uh, I was just wondering, what do you think about that? I think Telltale does some really interesting stuff in The Walking Dead in terms of exploring interiority. Um, you know, because Lee is a complex character that's not re really defined. You know, and pull your friends who played Walking Dead about what Lee did as a crime exactly. Like, was it a crime of passion? Was it deliberate? Did he do it at all? And you'll get different answers. Um, but because the story is in kind of a locked direction, I feel like your, your ability to be ethical is a little bit undermined, and if you start to see the ropes of it, you kind of understand what you can and can't do. What's interesting to me about Papers, Please, is because the narrative is actually looser, it's procedural. So there's a point at which there's a guy who's a guard who's like, hey, we came from the same hometown. And he comes up to you and he talks to you, and he's like, oh, we should hang out sometime. And then basically he's a border guard who's standing outside, and your ability to protect that guy actually can become important to you if you care about the fact that this guy's from your hometown. And he could die all sorts of ways. And it's not fixed at all. And I think that freedom of like that flexibility of your decision making actually mattering, like you actually do determine whether these people go or stay, puts the stakes in this game in a way that I think is even more profound than what Walking Dead does by allowing you to inhabit the interiority of Lee. I, I can't really talk more about that without taking up all the rest of my time, but I'd be happy to discuss at a future point like the way interiority works in The Walking Dead. I think it's a really brilliant game. Um, I think that one of the things that Papers, Please does really well is that it, it limits our possibilities, so it makes it very comprehensible. I definitely think if you look at like open world games, like the, some of the stuff that, that Bethesda does with like the Elder Scrolls and things like that, there are hints of this in there too, and the fact that you can kind of run around and do whatever you want, and all that you're evaluated on is sort of the way, uh, the opinions that people have of you. I think those are systems where there's sort of slightly more open-ended choices, but I think with games like this, you always end up in a challenging place, like, like the more you expand these choices, the more content you have to have to cover those choices, it just starts to become more challenging to like really represent the space. And one of the things I like about what Pope did with this game is like it keeps it small enough that like the ramifications are very clear. But I do think there's a lot of space for us to explore these kinds of issues using these kind of techniques. And, and I have never seen the, the quite combination of cost. Like that's what I really think is brilliant about Papers, Please, is the idea that like these ethical actions have a cost. When you make these decisions, you're, you actually have to sacrifice something. So when you have to think very hard about how to make them, and I think the potential to do that in other contexts and explore that in either like more specific ways that are just built around a single ethical choice or in other systems of ethics, I think is, is, is very broad. I hope that answers that question. Yes? All right, well, the only answer I have for this is that I studied philosophy when I was in school. And um, when I studied philosophy when I was in school, I had this conversation with one of my professors about ethics in which he said, um, 
you know, actually I think our high school education is completely stupid. Like the only thing that you should learn in high school is ethics. And I, I was like, I was like that's, that's nice that a philosopher said that. And he's like, no, what is more important than learning how to live a good life? I didn't really have an answer for that. Uh, I think that ethical questions like this are the content of so much of our storytelling and so much of our, our media that it's embarrassing that games haven't explored more of it. And so I think it's, it's critical that games start to ask these questions. But it needs to ask them in a way that, that makes it very real. Because I think there's a way of asking this question where we put people in uncomfortable positions. This is like God of War or Heavy Rain or a host of other games where we're put into uncomfortable narrative positions and we're asked to embody characters that we don't necessarily like. Um, and that's not ethical questioning, right? Ethical questioning comes from choice. Last question. Yeah, I think that I think there's a really interesting point in Papers, Please, where you just like the person comes without the, the the work permit, and you're just like, oh, would you come on? Like, I have to reject you, and I don't want to, but like, why did you have to do that to me, right? And I think there is an interesting question about empathizing with that person, but I also think there's an interesting role playing question about being a key in the bureaucracy, right? That like, what what it really is doing, you know, we we should remember is you're role playing the role of a border guard, and I and I. You know, I don't often try to empathize with TSA agents as someone who travels a lot. Um, but like, if you did try to, I can kind of imagine how I would get annoying um, and how difficult that job would be and how getting screamed at because I have to follow these stupid rules that I have to follow when I really didn't make them and I'm just trying to get my check and go home. I feel like that's a large part of what the game is about. So maybe what I would say in response to that is like, I still, I still think this is an excellent depiction of that kind of reality. But maybe if we want to make games, this is a, a, a good future step for ethics. If we want to make games that are going to be more about that kind of empathizing, that we would need to situate it in a different role that didn't drive us to those kind of bureaucratic mindsets. But good comment. Next time I will comment in your gone home talk. <laughs> Thank you, everybody. <laughs>